The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, well, let me start with a story. Um, some of you know that, that this is not a first career for me, and for a while I, I was uh, a pilot. And I was flying my plane one day, and I had a passenger next to me. Uh, we were down in Venezuela. And it turns out this passenger was actually a pastor from Pennsylvania. I'd never met him before, but he told me that he was going around visiting different missionaries that he knew that were working in very remote locations in Latin America, Asia, Africa, uh, and just wanting to be an encouragement to those missionaries. And so the very first missionary that he ever went to visit, when he got to that place, he asked this missionary, he said, hey, in the language of these people that you're working with, some primitive tribal language, how do you say thank you? And a lot of you have traveled internationally, and you know what it's like. You want to learn how to say please and thank you in the local language, so when somebody serves you in a restaurant or whatever, you know, you can, you can say something in their language. And the missionary said to him, these people don't have a word for thank you in their language. Like, well, that's weird. We've all grown up with languages, multiple languages, and we know thank you in lots of different languages. And as this pastor visited more and more missionaries and asked the same question, he got the same answer over and over again. And finally, he said to one of these missionaries, what's the deal? How can all of these different primitive people with their own distinct languages not have a word for thank you? And the missionary simply said to him, because in their culture and in their worldview, they have no concept of gratitude. You see, they believe that everything they have, they brought about themselves. If they have a house or a hut, it's because they built it. If they've got food on the table, it's because they planted a garden or they hunted or they fished. If they have a, a, a relationship with somebody, it's because they went out and got that person. And in some cases, they went and stole that person from another village. And so everything came right back to them and they had no reason to ever feel grateful to anybody for anything. And this was eye-opening to this pastor. Growing up here in America, it's like he had no concept of that world view. A total absence of thankfulness. Now, before we're too rough on these tribal people, I would like to suggest that they can actually serve as a mirror for us. And if we're willing to look deep within, we may find that we're not that different than some of these folks that have had no outside influence and have no concept of thankfulness. Because how often do we, as self-made people, fall into that same trap? I worked for it. I studied for it. I did this. I did that. I bargained for it, paid for it. What I've got is mine. I'm the one who brought all this to bear and completely leave God out of the equation. We have a word for thankfulness in our language. We use it, but I think that we've tamed that word. I, I think we've domesticated it. We've, we've tamed it so that we can control it. I walked in the front door this morning at the, at the school here, and I've got things in my arms, and somebody opens the door for me, and I walk through, and I say thank you to them. But in my mind, I'm thinking, I could have gotten through the door myself. I didn't really need you to do that. But, you know, thanks. And we go out to lunch together. And we eat lunch, and then I pick up the tab. And you say Thank you to me. But you're thinking, I got money. I could have paid for lunch. I'll get it next time. 
That's what we've done to the concept. But, but those are trivial areas. And we've done the same thing in the much more significant areas of our lives. And when we do that, we end up in the exact same place as these primitive people that have had no outside teaching to let them know that gratitude is actually something quite significant. Now, church, this is a problem for us. This, this is not something insignificant. This is a problem because when we subscribe to this worldview that we are self-made people, that we are self-sufficient people, that what we have, we somehow made it happen, what we're doing is we're pushing God into the corner. We're, 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 we're telling God, will you just stay over there? If I have a real bad emergency, I'll seek you out. But basically, the rest of it, I got it, God, I'm good. And you see how dangerous that is? Terribly, terribly dangerous. We have a problem when we start to believe this way. Thankfully, God and his word will reveal to us a remedy for this problem. And we're going to look at Psalm 34 today. We're in this study that we're calling a song for all seasons as we look at the book of Psalms. And today's Psalms, we're going to find somebody who has the opportunity to kind of rearrange his thinking in terms of God and where everything comes from that we have or that this individual has. If we will allow it, God will transform us through his word. He'll transform our perspective of thankfulness and he'll transform us if we're willing to allow him to do that. So let me pray for us and then we will go into the word of God. Father, this has been a great day so far. Your presence here has been undeniable. And God, I thank you for those who led us in worship. I thank you for the Lord's prayer that was presented to us in a powerful way. I thank you for these, these lives um, that have been committed to you and people willing to make a public confession of their faith in Jesus Christ. We have been blessed. And now, God, as we turn to your word... We come to you as people who need to hear from you. So would you please just open the eyes of our heart. Help us to be ready to allow you to transform us for your glory. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So Psalms 34 is, is, Psalm 34 is one of the few psalms that has a little header at the beginning of it. If you've got a Bible or, a, or a, an electronic device, you can see that before verse 1, there's this little header. And I want us to pay attention to that because it sets the stage for the whole psalm. And here's what it says. It says, this is a psalm of David when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech who drove him away and he left. Now, there's probably some of you, when you hear that or read it, you're kind of scratching your head. It's like, what is that about? It just seems really odd, doesn't it? Well, thankfully, Scripture answers that question for us because we can go back to the book of 1 Samuel. You don't need to turn there. I'll tell you what happens. And we find the very episode that it is referring to there that we as a reader need to know if we're really going to understand this psalm. And, and here was the deal, okay? This is David, the guy who would ultimately become the king of Israel, the greatest king that Israel ever had. But he wasn't king yet. He was actually the leader of the armies of Israel. The king was a guy named Saul. And Saul had messed up one too many times, and God said, Saul, you're done. You, you have, you've worked yourself out of a job. You are not going to be the king anymore. This guy, David, now is going to be the new king of Israel. Now Saul, given the kind of guy he was, he just decided, okay, fine, I'm going to take David out and then I can continue to be king. So Saul and his army start pursuing David all over the land and even outside of the land of Israel to try to catch him and kill him so Saul could retain his throne. David becomes a fugitive. We read that he hides out in caves and in the mountains, and he's always trying to stay one step ahead of Saul. Of course, God is protecting him because he's going to be the next king. And at times, David even went over to, to enemy kingdoms in the area to seek protection from them. You know the saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend? And David thought, hey, I can go over here, and these guys don't like Saul, and Saul's after me, so maybe they'll give me protection. Sometimes it worked. In this case, when he went to King Abimelech in his kingdom, it didn't work so well. Because what happened was King Abimelech had servants who knew all about David. And as soon as David came in seeking refuge from King Abimelech, 
the servants started saying, oh, we know who this guy is. He was the leader of the armies of Israel. He, 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 he led them in victory after victory. He wiped all kinds of people out. And now he's come here to us. What's going on? And so they said that to the king, and David realizes his cover is blown. They, they know who he is. They, they, they're afraid of me now. They, they don't want to give me protection, and David is sweating bullets. He knows he can't fight his way out of this one. He can't talk his way out of this one. He's in huge trouble, literally thinking he might be at the end of his life because King Abimelech could, could take his head if he wanted to. And what happened was God asked David to do something completely counter to who he was. David, the mighty warrior, the leader of the armies, God puts into his head, David, play the fool. What? No, give me a sword. David, play the fool. And so scripture tells us that David starts drooling and letting the drool run down his beard. And he starts acting like an insane person. He goes over to the doors and he starts making marks on the, the doors. And King Abimelech says, don't I have enough madmen around here? Get this guy out of here. And he kicked him out. And that's how David made his escape and escaped with his life. So that's the backstory to this psalm. And as we listen to the words of David here with that in mind, it helps us understand what was going on. So I'm going to read the first seven verses and the last seven verses of Psalm 34 so you guys can kind of get the story. Psalm 34, 1. David says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. This is the word of God for us today. And I'd just like to point out three things in this psalm here. Now that we know the backstory, I'd like to look at what David says about his own condition. What, what are his own words describing the condition that he was in? And then I would like to look at what David says about God's intervention. What does God do as a result of the condition that David is in? And finally, I would like us to notice what is David's response once he sees how God intervenes on his behalf. So let's just jump into this for a couple minutes. And all I want to do here as we look at David's condition is I want to point out some key words that David uses to describe himself and the predicament that he's in. But I'd like to ask you to not only just hear these words, but ask yourself the question, how do these apply to my own life? Am I facing any of those things right now? Maybe not to the same magnitude David was, but do any of these words describe me? Okay? David starts out by saying that he was in fear. He was in fear. He was fearing for his life. And the word that he uses means dread or terror as he reflects back and describes what it was like standing before King Abimelech. He says he was in fear. He said he was experiencing shame. Now, I don't know why he was experiencing shame. It might have been that he felt like he made a bad decision going seeking refuge from Abimelech. We don't know. But David says he was experiencing shame. Anybody here today experiencing fear or shame right now? David 
certainly was. He admits it. He refers him to himself as this poor man. Uh, he was experiencing poverty, not necessarily financial poverty, but a poverty of security, a poverty of knowing if his life was even going to be his in a few hours. He calls himself this poor man. He says he was troubled, says he was brokenhearted. Can anybody relate to any of this? He says he was crushed in spirit. So, so David's got some pretty good self-awareness here, wouldn't you say? He was fearful. He was experiencing shame, poverty. He was troubled, brokenhearted, crushed in spirit. In a word, we could say David felt hopeless. He felt like he was at the end of his rope or beyond. There was nothing he could do. He couldn't be clever. He couldn't be strong. He couldn't do anything to get out of this situation. He was hopeless. And he knew his life might almost be over. That was David's condition, as stated by David himself. Now, what about God's intervention? How does David now describe what God does as David was in the midst of what he just described for us? David says that God saw him and that God heard him. So in the midst of David's disastrous situation, he realized, oh, you know what? God isn't missing any of this. He knows exactly what's going on right now. God sees me and he hears me. Whether David was crying out with his mouth or his heart, it didn't matter. God heard David's cry. And then David says, and he answered me. God saw him, God heard him, God answered him. David goes on to say that God saved him from all his troubles. And he did. He completely got him out of the situation that he was in. He says that God stayed with him. Do you ever doubt God's presence with you? Do you ever feel alone? Do you feel abandoned? Do you feel like God is somewhere way off someplace and, and, and you don't know where he is? David says, no, God stayed with me through this whole ordeal. He says God protected him. And then in the last verse of this psalm, David says God rescued me. He rescued me. The definition of rescue is when something does for you what you could never do for yourself. Because if you could do it for yourself, you would. And then you wouldn't need to be rescued. And David knew he was way beyond helping himself. And he says God was the one who rescued me. So we see David describe his condition as being hopeless. Then we see him describing God's intervention as being completely comprehensive. God did it all. He saw him. He heard him. He answered him. He saved him from his troubles. He protected him. He rescued him. And then finally, I just want us to look at how does David respond to this once he realizes the predicament he was in and he sees the way God intervened on his behalf, how does David now respond to this? Well, if you recall, the first three verses in the chapter that we read were nothing but praise and worship to God. He's pouring out his heart in thanksgiving to God for what God has done for him. And then David goes on and he gives God all the glory and he gives God all the credit. Now, this is unusual for the mighty warrior. This is unusual for the guy who has led the armies of Israel in victory time after time because every time David would come back from defeating the enemies of God's people and he'd come into Jerusalem, the people would pour out into the streets. They'd chant his name. David is killed. Is the... On and on it went. David's taking no glory and no credit at this point. He's pointing only to God. Now, this for us would be as difficult as it would have been for David. We naturally like to get the credit, right? If we've done something good or if we've whatever success, we want some credit. We want to be noticed. We want to be recognized. We want a little bit of glory. But the problem with that is when we go that direction, thankfulness evaporates. Why would we be thankful or grateful if we think that we're the ones that pulled this off? And we don't see any of that in this situation with David. And I would say, church, that this is really the heart or the essence of true thanksgiving. 
when all the credit and all the glory is given to someone else. In this case, given to God, because God did things for David that he never could have done for himself. And so his gratitude to God, his thankfulness to God is, 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 is pure. I would say this is the best definition we could have of thanksgiving, and we see it here in this psalm. Now, I just want to leave you with two challenges today from this psalm. Two, two things that, if, if these stick with you, uh, that will probably be uh, a good thing. The first one is this. I would like to challenge you to let this be the year when you truly give God thanks for everything that he's done for you. Now, I know a lot of us say, well, I do, I do, I say thank you, God. No, no, I want us to stop and consider this. I, I want us to look into our own hearts and say, really? Or, or am I more like those primitive people that believe that I've done it all on my own? Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7. He's speaking to the church, and I think he was maybe a little bit impatient with them because he says this. He says, For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Paul says, What do we have that we have not received? The answer is nothing. You might say, well, you know, I've got this job, and I, and I earn this money, so I buy these things, so they're mine. Well, how did you get that job? Well, I got this education. Well, how did you get that education? Well, I worked real hard. And if you go back far enough, you find that our, our very intellect, our strength, our, our energy, our result, that all came from God. You, you can trace everything back to God. And the Apostle Paul is saying, why, why, do, you, why do you act like these things didn't come from somewhere else. Why do you think that you made these things happen yourself? Possessions, relationships, anything we've achieved in life so far. We couldn't have done anything, any of that, without God. Without God. Let this be the year that we truly become thankful people. There's a, there's a small group of us that meet over the church office on Friday mornings, 6 a.m. Yes, there are some morning people in this church. And uh, every week we gather together, uh, different leaders, sometimes different people there. You're all welcome. Please come join us. Um, and we meet for an hour. So this last uh, Friday morning we were there. Pastor David was leading us. And before we entered into a time of prayer, he said, let's go around the circle. I want to hear from everybody as we're entering this Thanksgiving season, what is one thing that you are particularly thankful for this year? I thought, okay, this is going to be interesting to just to kind of hear what kind of stuff comes out of people. Okay, so one guy says, I'm really thankful because Jesus Christ is, is making a big difference in my life, but lately I've been seeing that he's making a difference in my marriage, in my family, and in my business. Who gets the glory? Not this guy. He's given it all to God, not only for his personal life, but his relationship to his wife, his children, and his business environment. Somebody else brought up a, a, a pretty much life and death physical situation that they were concerned about, and, and it was going the wrong way. And in the last little bit, they'd seen God turn that thing around and, and bring healing and restore things that had been lost. And this individual was just doing so much better now. Again, all the glory to God. One person talked about a, a disastrous family situation, just fragmented, just mission impossible, too messy to ever imagine being cleaned up. And they said that in the last few months, they had seen God bring restoration and reconciliation to that family, to where that family was actually united and becoming more united, when not too long ago it looked like never going to happen. I thought, you know, this is really good. These people are getting what Thanksgiving is all about. These aren't the kind of things that they could have said, yeah, but I could have done that myself. All of these were far, far beyond that. Church, let's let this be the year that we become those kind of thanksgivers. That's the first challenge I want to leave with you today. Second challenge I'd like to leave with you, second of two, so the last one, 
is I would like it if this would be the year that we would take the cross uh, much more seriously. Now you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, Psalm 34, I don't see the cross anywhere in Psalm 34. Uh, that's about Jesus. Psalm 34 is about David and the Old Testament. What do they have to do with each other? Thank you for asking. When we look at Psalm 34 and see David's condition, what we see is a picture of our condition without Christ. David was hopeless. We, we read the words. Some of you are experiencing that, but David was in this hopeless situation. And for us, as we look at ourselves spiritually apart from God, we are every bit as hopeless. We're separated from God. The Bible calls that spiritual death, and dead people cannot do anything for themselves. That's where we were, helpless. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 the Apostle Paul says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So, so Paul paints the picture, sinful, separated from God, can't do anything to save yourself, you're hopeless. But in the midst of that, at our very worst, God intervenes. And he intervenes by doing something that humanly seems as inappropriate as God telling David to act the fool, to play the fool. Because he sends his son, Jesus Christ, to die a criminal's death, even though he'd never committed a crime. A shameful thing in that day, an embarrassing thing. This is what Jesus comes and does for us because we couldn't do it for ourselves. Being as hopeless as David was in front of Abimelech, God sends Jesus to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. He rescues us, just like David says that God did for him in that situation, that God rescues us. And God does it by sending a substitute who actually could pay the price that we owed. We get to respond then, just like David got to respond when he experienced what God did for him. David's response was praise and worship and thanksgiving. Our response is that we get to say yes to what Jesus did on our behalf. We, we get to actually accept that gift, that provision, that rescue that God did on our behalf. And then, like David... We should be very, very grateful people. We should be very thankful for what God did on our behalf. You see, church, when we begin to understand the cross the way David understood his own predicament and God's intervention, then our response should be one of deep, deep gratitude. And we should be saying, thank you, God. And when we say that, we're not thinking in our heads, but I could have done it myself. If you'd have just left me a little longer, God, I could have figured this one out. No, no, we don't say that in our heads. In our heads, we say, God, I never could have done this myself. I was completely hung, and you intervened on my behalf. And then we can use David's language right out of Psalm 34, because David says that God delivered him, and that's what God does for us. And God removes our shame because of what Christ did for us on the cross. And God saves us from all of our troubles. And God lifts us up when we were crushed in spirit. God indeed rescues us. But it was a very costly rescue. It actually cost him the life of his son, Jesus Christ. And so it's only appropriate for us to be very, very thankful people as we consider the cross. And when we respond with, thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for us, he responds back to us, you're welcome. This is the very reason that I came to this earth. Would you pray with me, church?